Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, there doesn't seem to be any sound in this mic. But yeah, if someone could, you know, get us started off with a word of prayer, please. Anyone willing to volunteer to lead us in prayer? And after that, yes. we can our session. Yeah. Yes. Father God, we are so grateful once again for gathering us from the wicked. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who has arrived and even those who are on the way coming. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us and preparing our teacher. As we receive from you the counsel of God, Lord, may we grow in the knowledge of the Lord. We pray that our minds are going to be alert and open so that we may receive everything that you have on us on your table. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, so last week we started off with the book of Samuel. We looked at 1 Samuel. We looked a little bit at uh, the contrast between David and Saul. And uh, so this week we will be looking at David in greater detail. Uh, so we kind of looked at the structure of 1 Samuel. Um, we saw that in 1 Samuel chapters 1 to 15 is where uh, you have the actual transition taking place from the time of judges into the time of the monarchy, where a king, where the people ask for a king and the Lord gives them a king. So we see that in the first 15 chapters of First Samuel. And then from there, um, you know, we go into First Samuel chapters 16 to 31, where you have a description of what Saul did and the responses of David. So we see the contrast between these two figures. And then we move into 2 Samuel. So this will be the basic structure of 2 Samuel. The first 10 chapters is where you have a description of the rise of David, how he becomes the kind of king that God wanted. He becomes the human representative that God had in his mind. Uh, that would be in the first 10 chapters. Uh, but then chapter 11 and 12, talk about the downfall of David, where he strays away from his faithfulness to the Lord. He falls into sin. And uh, so in those two chapters, 2 Samuel 11 and 12, it talks about uh, the sin which he committed. And then in chapters 13 to 20, you know, in all these chapters, you have a description of the consequences of his action. Because he sinned against the Lord, because this representative of Yahweh did not stay faithful to Yahweh, but because he sinned, there were so many consequences which followed. And we see that in chapters 13 to 20. And finally, chapters 21 to 24 is like a summary of all the good and the bad which took place during his reign. Uh, so this would be a rough structure of this uh, book of second Samuel. Now, um, in the early years, we see that David achieves what the judges and Saul had failed to do. He's in fact able to conquer many of the territories which God had appointed for them as a nation. You know, the judges had failed uh, to acquire those lands, um, and um, even Saul had failed to gain proper victory over the Philistines. But now, during the time of David, because the Lord's uh, you know, hand of favor is upon him. He is able to conquer many of the territories and he's able to expand the size of Israel to a great extent. And then he also makes a very wise, you know, strategic move. He captures Jerusalem and he makes Jerusalem his capital. Why did uh, David choose Jerusalem? Uh, it's because Jerusalem up to that point was under the Jebusites. Nobody was able to displace the Jebusites because they were in a very powerful position. But David, with the favor of God, is able to defeat the Jebusites and bring this place under the control of Israel. And so Jerusalem is kind of neutral territory. It doesn't belong to the northern tribes, uh, you know, nor does it belong to Judah. So the People of the northern tribes cannot, you know, complain and say, uh, you know, ah, see, he's choosing one of the cities of Judah as his capital because he's, he's a Judahite. So, you know, they, they will not make that allegation. In the same way, even the people of Judah cannot make a 
complaint and say rc is choosing one of the uh, cities from the other tribes even though he belongs to us even though he's one uh, he's a judahite you know like us so both sides would have probably complained if he had chosen another one of the important cities as his capital but jerusalem was like neutral territory it had not belonged to either side up to now so he takes that place and makes it into his capital um and then of course he moves the tabernacle to jerusalem so that jerusalem is not only the political capital it's also the spiritual capital and the king will always be able to go to the uh, tabernacle consult the living god before he takes any of his decisions so his rule will be a god honoring rule which is under the control of yahweh and he will genuinely be yahweh's representative so with with that desire he moves the tabernacle also to jerusalem and so finally under his uh, rule a kind of god honoring environment is finally established in this land but it's so sad you know when he falls into sin it would have been an encouragement to even the people to know go away into sin so the way a leader lives is so important because people tend to look up to him and people tend to imitate him so if the leader is weak that's like an encouragement to the people to the followers also to be weak in their spiritual decisions you know so um what david did later uh, had very Uh, far reaching repercussions but in the early years we see that he was a human representative who genuinely represented yahweh so he attempts to um, maintain proper worship of yahweh throughout the land so because um david had this status of being god's representative he could not live the way other rulers and kings lived for them what would be the main goal in their minds it's the same goal which our politicians have today you know of being the most powerful of having the maximum control of being able to make the most money that is basically the goal of most leaders but because david is yahweh's representative and he's not just a leader he has to work towards higher standards he always has to keep in mind that he is not priority number 1 it's yahweh who is the first priority so he needed to live in a different way and in fact in his early years and also in his, in his last years he is able to fulfill this uh, we see the the testimony which god gives regarding him you know i mean um, people stand up and they testify about someone that they know i mean this especially happens during funeral services where someone who knows the person who has passed away goes in the front and gives a testimony saying you know this person was like this this is what he did this is how he influenced people this is how he benefited people here it's not a human giving a testimony about david god himself opens his mouth and this is what the lord the living yahweh the almighty one what he says about david it's recorded in acts chapter 13 verse 22 so it would be really nice to read that if we could have someone read out this verse for us acts 13 verse 22 even if anyone online would like to read out that would be fine and when he had removed him he raised up from the king david as king to whom also he gave testimony and said i have found david the son of jesse a man after my own heart who will do all my will here god himself testifies regarding king david and he says um I have found David son of Jesse a man after my own heart the things which concern God's heart those are the things which concern David's heart what God loves yeah you know David also loves so God says here is a man who has the same heart that I do what interests me interests him so while all the kings you know in the other nations surrounding David were interested in power and money and influence 
here was a man who was not interested in those things his heart was interested in whatever yahweh is interested in and uh, so this caught god's attention that is the reason why god appointed him as his representative and this is what god says about david he says he will do everything i want him to do here is a representative who is going to be so faithful he will do whatever god asks him to do so the lord says everything i want him to do this person will do i mean it's an ultimate compliment being given by yahweh directly about this man uh you know that will be the desire of our hearts to be able to get a compliment like that from the lord um you know most of us sitting here in this room are never going to be called to rule a nation okay so we'll probably not become prime ministers or presidents but we all have our own callings to which yahweh himself has called us he has called us to be a parent he has called us to be an encourager he has called us maybe to be a software engineer he has called us uh, to share the gospel you know uh, with the with the people whom we know there are callings even upon our lives so even as we are walking through life with these callings resting upon our head you know this divine callings to which the lord has called us can he say about us here is a person who is after my own heart whatever interests my heart also interests this person's heart can the lord say that about you and me because if he can say that that will be the ultimate compliment which we can ever ever get you know so here regarding david the lord says everything i want him to do i know he will do so can the lord say that about us as parents you know can the lord trust us and say here is a person who will genuinely take their parenting seriously you know because like we were commenting last uh, class the old testament characters even though many of them were godly people they were pathetic parents absolutely no interest in bringing up their children in the ways of the lord i mean even a man like samuel you know who was such a wonderful respected person did not bother to bring up his two sons in the ways of the lord such a tragedy so even though parenting is one calling which is just dismissed and you know pushed to the side like as if it's something unimportant it's something important in the lord's eyes so can we as parents say that you know can the lord say about us as a parent whatever i expect of this person he is doing it can the lord say that about us you know in the, in the same way can the lord say that about us in our workplace can he say that about us when we are uh, maybe leading a bible study group or you know leading a cell group these things are not very glamorous running a nation you know that uh, attracts a lot of attention but someone who's going around you know encouraging other believers who i mean who you know gives him importance someone who's quietly doing his parenting in his house especially if he's parenting a stubborn you know young child who refuses to listen what's so glamorous about that but the lord is watching and so what what is the lord's impression finally about us and about the, and about the calling which he has placed upon us so you know i mean even you may just be when it comes to ministry you may just be leading a small cell group or you know or you know you may just be that one person who's uh, talking to your neighbors about the lord nothing glamorous about it but the lord who is watching will he get the impression that you really care about the same things which he cares about and you regard those things as important as god regards them so that would become very important in the lord's eyes so here we see that in the initial years the lord is very pleased with david and so the lord says that here is a man who is after my own heart and then later after he repents of his sinfulness and he comes back to the lord he again makes every effort to honor the lord yes he fell but after rising up again he once again commits himself to honoring the lord in every way so this is a good attitude for us to imitate um coming to something uh, that we see about david the kind of status that was given to him uh, we would see that in second samuel chapter 6 verses 17 and 18 If someone could read out Second Samuel six seventeen and eighteen, please.
these are the golden tumors which the philippi no yeah, yeah philippi because you're yeah. probably looking at first samuel second samuel 6 17 to 18 so they brought the ark of the lord and set it in the set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that david had erected for it then david offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the lord and when david had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings he blessed the people in the name of the lord of hosts we see david doing um priestly duties over here he's offering burnt offerings and he's offering the fellowship offerings and then after doing that he blesses the people in the name of the lord almighty this is not a person from the tribe of levi he's not a levite he's from the tribe of judah and yet we see him performing priestly duties over here so what we learn from this is that god wanted a human representative who will not only serve him in a political capacity and maybe in a military capacity, but also someone who will also serve him in a priestly capacity in the sense he would give spiritual leadership to the people. He would definitely not take on the you know duties of high priest and the, uh, the priests who are serving in the tabernacle. No, that is not his role. But he is supposed to be like a spiritual father to the entire nation and make sure that they're all walking in the ways of Yahweh. Make sure that they are not straying away from the commandments of the living God. So we see um, God's human representative also being, being given a kind of priestly role. And um, it's a scary thought, but that role rests even upon our shoulders today. Because we see that, right? Uh, in the New Testament, in uh, Peter, in the, uh, you know, it, Peter in his letter, he writes and he says, All believers now, we are priests to Yahweh. Whether we like it or not, this is a very um, high responsibility that has been placed upon the shoulders of every believer. So when you're having a priestly role where everything that you do and say, every decision that you make, is going to impact the way people are going to look at your God. You know, the decisions we take at our workplace. Based on that, people are going to see us and they're going to see our God in a particular way. So whether we like it or not, we have this priestly role where we are supposed to be worshipping him and serving him, not just on Sunday in the church, but even in our offices, even when we go out and hang out with friends. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we have this priestly role resting on our shoulders. We are supposed to be worshippers, always bringing him honor in even the most simple things that we do. Are we doing everything in our lives in an honorable manner, which is exalting his name? If we are not doing that, it means that we are being very bad priests. We are like Eli and his sons. Now, nobody wants to be like that, right? So this is a role which has been placed even upon us in the same way it was placed upon um, David. And so David had to be very conscious of the way he lived. He couldn't just live like the kings of the other nations. He had a priestly role to the almighty God, which he needed to fulfill most carefully. So every decision that he takes should, should be taken in a very God-fearing manner. And with this in mind, we see David wanting to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 6 is where you have the entire event described. Um, but then there are some details which we find in Chronicles, you know, which are not mentioned in 2 uh, Samuel chapter 6. So first, if we could go to the First Chronicles I know, um, account, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, Verses 1 to 4. Uh, and if someone could read out that. yes. Then David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds, hundreds and uh, with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, if it is of the Lord of our God, let us send out to our breath everywhere who are left in all the lands of Israel and with them to the priests and 
levitize who are in their cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us and let us bring the ark of god back to us for we have not inquired at since the days of saul then all assembly said that they would do so for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people so before bringing the ark to jerusalem david first consults all his officers he uh, he goes to each of them talks to them and then he talks to the entire assembly of israel and he says don't you think this is a good idea if we bring the ark over here to jerusalem then i will be able to go and consult yahweh before taking any decision so everything that i do i'll be doing it in line with yahweh and the people are pleased with what he is saying and in fact he invites priests and levites from all the territories to come for this grand occasion and uh, uh, so the people are also uh, you know with him in this decision and so together joyously as a nation they come together to bring the ark you know in a way that the lord deserves with honor with rejoicing with worship with respect so with that purpose in mind they all get together to bring the ark to to jerusalem and this is what it says in second samuel chapter 6 verse 5 so if someone could read out second samuel chapter 6 verse 5 And, and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of firewood, even on harp on, and on pastry and silver and cornet. Yeah, and the volume is not very clear. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was the volume was not very clear, uh, but yeah. um it says here that they were using a multiple you know um musical instruments everything which they owned they were using all their instruments to worship and it says they were celebrating with all their might before the lord this not a this not a very casual way that they were bringing the ark they were worshiping the lord with all their might and then as the cart is bringing the uh ark into the city uh the the wheels of the cart stumbles over something so because of that i know the ark is shaken and it looks like as if the ark may fall to the ground and so out of respect and honor for the ark and for the lord uzza puts out his hand he reaches out his hand to take hold of the ark and it says in verse 7 the lord's anger burned against uzza because of his irreverent act therefore god struck him down and so because uzza touches the ark he it literally drops down dead right then and there you know he is killed for what he has done and there are two responses of david which are recorded over here in verse 8 it says uh, in verse 9 it says okay verse 8 it says david was angry because the lord's wrath had broken out against uzza and second it says david was afraid of the lord that day and said how can the ark of the lord ever come to me his initial response is one of anger he thinks here we are trying to honor the lord to the best of our ability and the lord is this is what the lord did he killed the man who was trying to help the ark so he's angry his first initial reaction is anger and then he must have thought about it and really tried to figure out what had gone wrong and he thinks my goodness if this god is so holy and that scary how on earth can a person like me ever get the ark to jerusalem and so he decides it's better if the ark does not come over here maybe the whole of jerusalem would get destroyed in the process you know so he decides that the ark is instead going to be placed in the home of obed edom the gittite and so instead of the ark being delivered to jerusalem now the ark is 
uh, you know, arrives at the doorstep of Obed uh, Edom, the Gittite. What do you think was Obed Edom's response when he sees the ark parked outside his house? I mean, the ark is going to be in his house now onwards. And just now, a few hours ago, a man dropped down dead just because he happened to touch the ark. Can you imagine what would have gone through the minds of Obed Edom and his entire household over the next three months? I think that would probably have been the most godly family in the entire world. You could, you, can, you could have searched anywhere in the universe and no family would have been as God-fearing as that one family because they literally have the ark sitting inside their household. And the Lord looks at the way they respect him and the way they you know, reverence him. And it says that the Lord, um, it says in verse uh, 11, the Lord blessed him and his entire household. And then now King David is very interested because he says, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So now David thinks, oh, I think maybe I should bring the ark to Jerusalem so that Jerusalem can be blessed, so that my rule and reign can be blessed. And so uh, now he becomes open to the idea of bringing uh, you know, the ark to Jerusalem. But now, now he has done some research in the meantime and now things have clicked in his head. And we see that in First First Chronicles chapter fifteen, verse thirteen. First Chronicles fifteen, verse thirteen. If someone could read out. It was because it was because you the Levites did not bring it up the first time that the lord of lord lord our god broke out in anger against us we did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way exactly now david has understood what the mistake was the lord had very clearly commanded whenever the ark has to be moved from one place to another only one set of people who have consecrated themselves will do it. The Levites and Levites alone. Uzzah was not a Levite. So they did not bring up the ark in the prescribed way, in the way the Lord had asked them to do it. So, you know, David has now understood his mistake. And uh, let's also look at First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2. Same chapter, guys. If someone could read out First Chronicles then, two. Then David said, "No one but the Levites should carry the ark of God, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister to Him forever." Yeah, all the other nations would place their idols uh, and you know other objects of worship in carts, but the living God never said, "Place me, place my you know my representation in in a cart." The Lord said there's only one way that the ark would be transported with the Levites actually carrying it. But please note, the Levites would carry it, but they would never touch it because the ark had got these large rings on the sides. Okay, you, So you have four rings on, on, the, on the two sides. They would insert a pole through the rings and they would carry the pole. So nobody ever actually touches the ark physically. Basically, to simmer to symbolize the fact that humans are sinful, and He is a perfect holy God, and the holy perfect God does not want to be touched by imperfect sinful people. And imagine now today we you know can uh, just walk into God's presence without even thinking twice. That is what the blood of Jesus Christ could do for us. A human, not even a consecrated Levite, had the guts to touch the ark. But today, we just go to the very throne room of God, like it says in Hebrews 4, confidently because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. That's the level of cleansing which the blood of Christ has won for us today. It's an immense privilege, you know, which we should learn to appreciate. So, this time, they are careful to bring in the ark in the right manner the one thing that caught my attention when i was reading this passage i mean i know i have read it so many times in my life 
but once when i was reading it that phrase you know that phrase which caught my attention was in verse 7 second samuel chapter 6 verse 7 where it says the lord's anger burned against uzza because of his irreverent act i just paused and i said to myself lord all these people were trying their very best to show reverence that is what they were trying to do. You know, the people who are uh, dancing before the Lord with all their might and energy, using every single instrument, you know, musical instrument that they had in their possession. They were really trying to, re to re revere the Lord. But in God's eyes, it was an irreverent, disgusting act. And it made me ask the question, what do my actions look like in the Lord's eyes? I may be thinking that my life is very reverent. But what does God see when he looks at me? And I said, Lord, how on earth can I ever be reverent enough for you, you know, for you to consider it acceptable? And this is the verse which, you know, the Lord brought to my mind. Uh, so, you and I, are we worshipping this living God in a reverent manner? Really? In a way which pleases him? We may be thinking it's very reverent. But does the Lord look upon what we are doing and does he regard our actions and our you know, decisions as reverent? It's very simple, basic. I mean, we all know the you know uh, these, this verse. So if someone could turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. What does the Lord delight in? But the people took off the plunder. Uh, no, so now we are in First Samuel chapter fifteen. So yeah, if someone could read out First Samuel chapter fifteen, verse twenty-two. And Samuel said, "Has the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen is better than the faith of rams." This is what delights the Lord. This is what brings great delight and joy to His heart. Simple obedience and submission. So all the musical instruments that you are playing, all the singing and dancing that you're doing in front of the Lord is not good enough if that basic obedience and submission is not there. That brings much greater delight to his heart than all the, you know, uh, the other things which you can do for him. And so today, when we ask ourselves, what I am doing now, is it reverent or not? That would be the basic question. Am I living in uh, obedience and submission or not? I'm standing over here teaching a, a bunch of students, a most honorable thing to do. But the Lord is looking at my heart and he's thinking to himself, this woman who is standing over here, is she humble? in obeying, obeying me and submitting to me? Is she, is she standing here and teaching with that attitude? That alone will please the Lord. Nothing else will. So for him, the heart matters. The attitudes and motives of the heart matter more than anything else. And if you can give him that, that reverence, that obedience, that submission, that's enough for him. You know, I may not be the greatest teacher on earth. I may not be able to teach spectacularly. But if that humble obedience and submission and the desire to give him the best, not the second best, is there, then the Lord is pleased. So, you know, let that be our attitudes in all the different roles which we play, you know, in our daily lives as um, people in ministry, as students, as, uh, as uh, you know, um, children of our parents, in all the different roles which we go through in a day. Any, let us be people who are obedient and submissive to him in all that we do. Um, let's look at um, another aspect of this whole reverence, you know, which we need to give to the Lord. We see that in David's attitude. Now, this is the second time that the ark is being brought, you know, to the to Jerusalem. And now uh, David is again dancing before the Lord. And we have the account of Michelle and her response to this whole thing. Uh, so, now we are again in 2 Samuel. Uh, so 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 to 16, if someone could read out. 2 Samuel 6, 14 to 16. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, 
and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trum trumpet. Now as the as the ark of Lord came into the city of David, Michael Michael Saul's daughter uh, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and uh, whistling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. It says over here that you know um, David's wife Michelle. She looks at David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and it says she despised him in her heart. You know, this is a princess, not exactly your commoner. You know, she's she's grown up in uh, uh, in Saul's royal palace. So from childhood, she knows how to live in a walk in a dignified manner, address people in a dignified manner. She not exactly go around saying hi to people. She she has to maintain her dignity, so she knows how to be royal hood, because she's been royalty all her her entire life, and so she looks at her husband, dancing and leaping in front of the ark, and she feels ashamed. She thinks, my goodness, what kind of a man have I ended up marrying? You know, so she despises him in her heart, and this is what she says to him. You know, David is coming so happily. I kind of you know I find this touching. He comes home with full enthusiasm to bless his household. You know, yes, he, he has blessed all the people of Israel after bringing in the ark. Now he wants to go home and bring God's blessings upon his family members. And when he joyfully walks in through the door to do this, this is his wife's response. Second uh, Samuel chapter six, verse twenty. Someone could read out. When David had returned home to bless his household, Michelle, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said. How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked to full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. Okay, so um, look at the wording over here. This translation, um, you know, um, it says that he was uh, what going around half naked, um, shamelessly like a vulgar fellow. Now, is this a correct translation? We would first of all need to look at that, uh, because the Hebrew word which is used over there, you know, if we were to go to your NKJV, uh, which tries to do a literal translation from the Hebrew into the into English, over there it says, "How glorious was the King of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants." Um, so, what does that word "uncovering" mean? That Hebrew word that is used over there, that word is the word uh, G A L A H. Uh, yeah, G A L A H, gala. Okay, so uh, don't think Hindi, think Hebrew. Okay, so it's that word gala over there, uh, which is basically has the meaning to reveal something which is hidden. Okay, gala basically means to reveal something which is hidden. Let's look at two scriptures. Where this particular phrase is used, uh, let's first look at Genesis chapter thirty-five, verse seven. Genesis thirty-five, verse seven. And he built, <coughs> and he built there, there an altar, and called the place El El Belt, because they are, because their God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. So, if you were to look at the Hebrew, that's the word which is used over there. It was there that God gala Himself to Jacob. It is where God revealed Himself to Jacob. The same phrase is again used in First Samuel chapter three, verse twenty-one. So, if someone could also read out that First Samuel chapter three, verse twenty-one. And the Lord appear again in Shiloh for the. For the Lord revealed Himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Again, over here, the same word is being used, and it says that Yahweh gala Himself, Yahweh revealed Himself to Samuel through His word. Okay, so that is the that is one meaning of this Hebrew word gala. And of course, there's also the other meaning, uh, which we find in Genesis chapter nine twenty one, where Noah makes a fool of himself. Genesis nine. Twenty-one. And he drank of the wine, 
and was drunk, and he was uncovered within his tent. Okay, so over here, uh, Noah got drunk. Brother, if you could mute yourself. Thanks. Yeah. So, you know, he, he has gotten drunk and he is lying over there. Gala is lying over there, revealed. Over here, it's talking about physical exposure. Because he is in a drunk condition, you know, his robe is opened and he's exposing himself in a humiliating manner. So there are two meanings to this word gala. So which, which application should we use when we talk about King David who has revealed himself? You know, his wife says to him, how, how glorious was the king of Israel today, revealing himself in front of everyone. So was David physically exposing himself? No, because it very plainly says, you know, in the previous verse that in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14, that David was wearing a linen ephod. A linen ephod was the uniform which the Levites would wear while performing their temple duties in the tabernacle. So it was an honorable uniform which uh, the priests were supposed to wear. And so now because David is performing this priestly duty of bringing in the ark to Jerusalem, he is also wearing a linen ephod. He's most definitely not physically exposing himself in any way. So it's, it's the other kind of revelation that Michel is so bothered about. David is wearing his royal clothing and, uh, you know, if um, someone here mute for us, muted for us, um, you know, so that it doesn't keep... Would you know how to do that? Okay, it's done. It's, yeah, it's muted. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, what was I saying? Yeah. Michel would have preferred it if he was wearing his royal robes and walking in a dignified manner in front of all of the people because this is a very special occasion where he's doing something major which will really impact his political you know, authority. So she would have preferred him to really make a royal entrance. But he's wearing a linen ephod and he's happily dancing along with all the other priests to honor the Lord. And she does not like it because it is not royal enough in her mind. But this is David's response. This is what David says um, when, you know, when she says this to him. She, he replies and he says uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 21, David said to Michelle, it was before the Lord who chose me. And then again, he repeats that at the end of the verse, he says, I will celebrate before the Lord. You see, woman, I was standing in front of the Lord, Yahweh. Once you're in front of Yahweh, hardly matters whether you're a king or a commoner. You're just a created being. And you're standing before your creator. And you better honor him. So once you're you know, in front of Yahweh, attending to him, ministering to him, hardly matters who you are, what your status is as a human. In front of him, you are just a created being in front of the creator God and you better worship him with all your might. And that is what David was doing over here. And that is why he says, you know, um, in uh, the next uh, verse, in verse 22, he says, I will become even more undignified than this. You know, if it is necessary for me to express my worship and adoration by being even more undignified, no problem. That's exactly what I will do. Because when you're in front of the creator, he matters, not your you know, your human status. And I think this is a lesson which is very important, especially for those of us who are planning on going into full-time ministry. Something about our Indian culture, where we respect religious leaders and almost treat them like gods. And it can be any religion, whether, it, whether it's a Muslim imam or whether it's a, it's a Hindu guru or a Christian pastor. People tend to show them such respect almost as though they are gods. And sometimes these humans forget that they are just created beings. So you and I, if, if the Lord lifts us up into positions where, you know, uh, we receive honor from people, let us not forget the fact that in front of Yahweh, you are just a created being. And he needs to, you know, to needs to receive all the honor and the glory. So let us be humble like David was, who understood who he was. Yes, God had made him king. God had given him victory over the Philistines. 
God had helped him to expand the land of Israel. God had done great things. But at the end of it all, he's just a created being in front of his creator. And that is why he worships him the way he does. And that's a lovely lesson for us to carry away. We see David you know, expressing the same honor for the Lord even later after his fall, after he has sinned. And you know, um, now he's beginning to suffer all the consequences of his sin. Because in um, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 9 to 12, this is what the Lord says, because you despised the word of the Lord, because you fell into sin, these are the consequences which will come upon you. And the Lord gives a frightening list of consequences which will come upon David's head. And uh, one of the main things which the Lord says is, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. And he says that one of his own household will sleep with his wives, you know, completely dishonoring him and dishonoring his kingship. So this is what the Lord says. And then we see that it happens through uh, Absalom, his son. Absalom, his son, wants to climb onto the throne. He wants to, you know, discredit his father because uh, David has always made it clear that Solomon is the one who's going to get the throne one day. But Absalom does not want that. He's power hungry. And so he comes up with a conspiracy against David. And David has no choice. Uh, you know, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15 is where we see the story. News comes to David that his son has taken over. And now, you know, if they, if they, if they don't escape, they're all going to die. So David says, you know, we all have to run from here. We have to leave the city and go seek shelter somewhere else. And so David and all the people who are loyal to him, they all immediately flee from Jerusalem. At that point, you know, the priests who are loyal and who love the king, David, you know, they, they take the ark along with them in the hope that the ark will bring protection to them even as they go through the fields and the wilderness and out in the open, you know, where anyone can attack. So at that time, David, he, he you know, speaks these beautiful words for which we do not have time. <laughs> the time factor is always upon us. Um, so anyway, this is what he says in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 25 onwards. He says, you know, take the ark back to the city. Don't bring it out here into the wilderness. Because out here in the wilderness, anyone can capture the ark and dis bring dishonor to the name of Yahweh. So he says, take the ark back. You know, and then, and then he says to the priest in the next sentence, he says, do you understand? Go back to the city with my blessing. I'm telling you people, take the ark back. If the Lord wants me to stay alive, he will bring me back to the city. And I will be able to bow down in front of the ark again. But don't let the ark be exposed. Don't let it be harmed. We look at the humility and the heart of David after his fall. You know, after he has repented of his sins, he comes back to the Lord and he now wants to honor the Lord just as much as he used to before. So you and I may fall at times. Yes, we have this deep desire to worship and honor him. But at times we may fall. But when we fall, let us be like David who humbled himself, who repented and decided now onwards, I will continue to honor him. And he took this decision while all the consequences are, are coming upon his head. You see, his son, God never said that, you know, you'll come back from the wilderness alive. His son might have killed him out there. But he says, if the Lord wants me to stay alive, fine. If the Lord wants me killed, that's also fine. So here is a man who really had the same heart that Yahweh did. You know, so let us... Uh, you know, wish to emulate and you know, imitate this man of God in our own priestly role as believers today. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for the powerful lessons which you uh, have uh, you know, written in your word for us to read, to learn from, to accept correction from. So we pray, O oh Lord, that even as we uh, meditate upon these lessons, we will apply them to our lives and live in a way which honors and lifts you up, O Yahweh. We pray that we will be people who will honor you, O Lord, in our decisions, in our lifestyle, and in the way we lead people, O Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.